Uh, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Ina Goldberg and I teach English to a lot of people. And some of you have heard this lecture before in class, or Woo! parts of it. Reppin. And um, others have not. But what I'm going to talk about is anti-Semitism in Shakespeare. And if he is anti-Semitic, what are we doing teaching it in the Jewish school? Um, but I have a lot more things to say before we get to that subject. Um, first of all, if anyone is under the impression that anti-Semitism in literature happened a long time ago and far away, you know, I hope to change your mind right now. For me, the big moment of truth came not when I was your age in high school. Um, at that point, I thought that nothing was really anti-Semitic in literature. Here and there, there would be a reference, but it was long ago and far away. When I got to college, one of the first courses I took um, was an American literature course, and I bought the books, and I went back to my dorm room. And one of my friends, who had a room next door, came by and said, did you look at this book? The book was um, The Sun Also Rises by Ernest Hemingway, who, when, uh, I, this is, uh, don't tell anybody else this, but I was still alive, or he was still alive <laughs> when I was co in college, so <laughs> kind of dates me. But, um, you know, for me, this was modern literature. And I opened the book, the book was The Sun Also Rises. It was actually written in 1926. Um, and Hemingway won a Nobel Prize in 1954. He died in 1961. Um, and this is the way it starts. Robert Cohn was once middleweight boxing champion of Princeton. Do not think that I am much impressed by that as a boxing title, but it meant a lot to Cohn. He cared nothing for boxing. In fact, he disliked it, but he learned it painfully and thoroughly to count counteract the feeling of inferiority and shyness he had felt on being treated as a Jew at Princeton. He was so good that his coach promptly overmatched him and got his nose permanently flattened. This increased Cohn's distaste for boxing, but it gave him a certain satisfaction of some strange sort, and it certainly improved his nose. He continues. He had a hard Jewish stubborn streak. He looked a great deal as his compatriot must have looked when he saw the promised land. Cohn, of course, was much younger. But he had that look of eager, eager, deserving expectation. Let him not get superior and Jewish. He's got this Jewish superiority so strong that he thinks the only emotion he'll get will be being bored. Cohn had a wonderful quality of bringing out the worst in anybody. Do you think you amount to something, Cohn? Do you think you belong here among us? Do you think we want you here? Do you think you add to the party? I hate him. I hate his damn suffering. That's from Hemingway. His fault, Cohn's fault, he was hanging around with the crowd, the same crowd. He was in love with the same woman that everybody else in the book was in love with. Um, he's doing what they do, and they hate him for it. The characters in this book, and I believe the author of this book, um, is not expecting the readers to be sympathetic with Cohn. He's not saying this because it's an attitude of the time. He's saying this because he means it, the characters mean it. And, you know, I think that's uh, a pretty anti-Semitic statement for a book that won the Nobel Prize um, made. After that book, um, we moved on to Fitzgerald and The Great Gatsby, and as all of um, you know, having read it, one of the characters in it is Mayor Wolfsheim, the quintessential crook, who was a gambler, a bootlegger, who fixed the World Series, and who was a Jew. The list goes on. Dickens and his creation of Fagin in Oliver Twist. He, he, Fagin is an evil Jewish uh, thief who made a home for runaways and orphans in London's cheap side. He taught them how to pick pockets, and then he took their spoils in return for feeding them and clothing them and sheltering them. Um, he's not the worst of the anti-Semitic characters. He has a kind streak, but he's also a villain. Um, and a century later, closer to home, a book by a Jew, Philip Roth, um, Goodbye Columbus, was about Jew New Jersey Jews, um, among them Neil Klugman, a poor Jewish boy, and Brenda Potemkin, a pampered rich Jewish girl. And they were unattractive stereotypes. So this, this trend uh, or you know, uh, anti-Semitism is present in, in fiction even today. But the most vicious by far 
were the authors that were um, revered the most. First, there was Chaucer, who wrote in the um, late 1300s. And one of his characters, the prioress in the Canterbury Tales, was um, he makes fun of everybody, and he made fun of her as well. But she was depicted as being um, very delicate, very um, sensitive. If a dog was beaten, she would weep. And um, yet, her tale, when it came time for her to tell a tale, was a vicious anti-Semitic screed told about a Christian boy killed by evil Jews for singing about the Virgin Mary. And the townspeople self-righteously kill the Jews in a parody of a pogrom. Um, this is Chaucer, our very Chaucer, whom we study. And then there was Shakespeare, the Bard of Avon. Um, let me just back up a second. Shakespeare and Chaucer wrote at a time when there was not a single Jew living in England. Before the end of the 13th century, King John and his later son, Henry III, had tolerated Jews for their wealth. They drained them of their wealth and then welcomed Italian Lombards to fill the economic gap left by the Jews after the Jews, all the Jews' money was given to the king. And then the kings had no more use for the Jews. So they expelled them from England in the year 1290 under King Edward I. Um, there only were about 16,000 Jews in England, but they were expelled. Most of those Jews went to France, and on the way, they, a lot of them were murdered, um, robbed and murdered. Sixteen years later, they were expelled from France. In 1492, they were expelled from Spain. Then they were expelled from Portugal, you know, hence the wandering the Jews. Um, they didn't return to England until Oliver Cromwell invited them back in 1652, but they still were disliked. Anyway, during Shakespeare's time, um, there were no Jews in England. And we need that as a, you know, to, to understand or to at least be upset about what he was about to do. Um, during Shakespeare's lifetime, or around that time, there was a Jew suspected of trying to kill um, Queen Elizabeth I um, on behalf of Spain. Um, he was innocent. There was no real proof that he had done anything wrong. Um, nobody did kill uh, Elizabeth, but he was executed anyway. And the playwrights, Shakespeare and his contemporaries, among them Christopher Marlowe, um, although they knew no Jews firsthand, did probably know this story, this false story, and they probably you know, believed it. Shakespeare's plays, um, some of them have anti-Semitic references, and one in particular is a very anti-Semitic play. Uh, let me go to this, the ones with smaller references first. In Macbeth, there's one reference when the Weird Sisters, the three witches, are cooking up their big cauldron. Into it, among other disgusting things, they put, quote, the liver of a blaspheming Jew. Blaspheming means lying Jew. So this is, this is a reference to what they, you know, what they thought of Jews at that time. In Hamlet, which some of you are reading now, um, there's, there are two characters, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. They're scoundrels, and they're indistinguishable from one another. The big running joke in Hamlet is that, is it Guildenstern and Rosencrantz, or Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, or Guildenstern and Rosenstern? It, you know, they're, they're constantly being mixed up. And this is, you know, this is the joke in Hamlet. Uh, they get theirs in the middle of the play. Hamlet turns on them. They're supposed to be delivering Hamlet to, um, to be murdered in England on, the, on uh, behalf of Claudius, who's the king, and it's a long, complicated story. But um, Hamlet finds out about this, and he uh, replaces some letters, which when they get to England, basically says, please kill Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, and they are, and they disappear from the play. Nonetheless, why have these in there? It's kind of gratuitous. Um, there, it's an anti-Semitic uh, inclusion here. But the most famous of them all, of course, is the Merchant of Venice. Um, Shylock is the uh, character that is the Jew in that. Merchant of Venice was um, ri written somewhere between 1598 and 1600. And um, the story goes like this. The Merchant of Venice is not Shylock. The Merchant of Venice is a man named Antonio. He is, um, is there a chair over there? Maybe. 
Antonio is, um, is a merchant. He has a bunch of ships, and they're all over the world. And he's a rich man. But right now, when the story opens, he doesn't have very much loose cash. And his best friend, Bassanio, wants to marry a woman named Portia, who lives in a magical place called Belmont. Um, all these other people live in Venice. And um, the story goes that in order to get to Belmont to participate in a contest, he has to choose her picture from three caskets. Um, my students already know this. Um, the three Ooh. caskets is one of gold, one of silver, one of lead, and that's, that's the main <laughs> plot. Um, Bassanio needs money to get there because he has to take a boat and he doesn't have any money, having spent his entire inheritance prior to this um, being a kind of profligate. Um, so he asks his friend Antonio for the money, and Antonio doesn't have loose cash, but he has security. He has a bunch of ships, and they're supposed to be coming back to Venice from all over the world with um, cargo that will make him rich. So on the basis of this, they go to Shylock, the money lender, to borrow money. And Shylock, because um, because the laws of Venice at that time prevented Jews from doing any other kind of business. Shylock was allowed as a Jew to uh, charge interest for his loans, and, and um, only Jews were allowed to charge interest for their loans at that time. So um, he is approached by Antonio and Bassanio and asked for the money, and he basically says, why should I give you money? You, Antonio, have given money, have lent money to people with no interest, and you've undercut what, um, you know, what I can do, how I can make my money. And on top of that, um, you have spit on me in the marketplace, and you have um, called a dog, and you've treated me pretty badly. Um, so why should I give you money? Why should I lend it to you? And um, they, you know, they argue for a while, and finally he says, um, you know, they insult him more, and uh, finally he says, okay, I'll lend you the money, um, and I won't even charge you interest for it. And he starts making a joke of it, and he says, what I'll charge you instead is a pound of your flesh. So he, um, you know, they, they, the Christians, Antonio and Bassanio, treat this like a joke. First they're a little stunned, but then they say, well, he doesn't mean that, you know, it's a joke. He, what he means is he's going to just give it to us. So anyway, uh, to make a long story shorter, um, the uh, ships of Antonio miscarry, and in a month's time, when it's time for Antonio to pay back the 3,000 ducats which Shylock has lent him, there, uh, there's no money for him to pay uh, Shylock back. So the question is, does Shylock um, take the pound of flesh or not? Um, before I get into that, in the meantime, um, uh, Shylock has a daughter named Jessica who is interested in a Christian man named Lorenzo. And um, we'll get to that in a minute. Anyway, Shylock, uh, Shylock is, finally brings this case to court after Antonio defaults on his loan. Um, he brings the case to court and he says, uh, you know, what can I do about this? Meanwhile, Bassanio has been successful in his suit to marry Portia. And she says to him, look, I'll give you money. Uh, you can pay back Antonio's uh, debt. So all of this is going on in court, and Shylock says, no, um, I don't want the money from anyone else. He defaulted. The date has come and gone. I want the pound of flesh. And they say to him, the Christians, um, you know, what good is it? And uh, Shylock replies the following, to bait fish with all. It will feed nothing else. It will feed my revenge. He hath disgraced me and hindered me half a million, laughed at my losses, mocked at my gains, scorned my nation, thwarted my bargains, cooled my friends, heeded mine enemies, and what's his reason? I am a Jew. Hath not a Jew eyes? Hath not a Jew hands, organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions? Fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapons, subject to the same diseases, healed by the same means, warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer as a Christian is? If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not seek revenge? 
If we are like you in the rest, we will resemble you in that. If a Jew wrong a Christian, what is his humility? Revenge. If a Christian wrong a Jew, what should his sufferance be by Christian example? Revenge. The villainy you teach me, I will execute. And it shall go hard, but I will better the instruction. And for Shylock, it does go hard. His daughter Jessica, around this time, betrays him, steals his money and his jewels, including a ring that his wife gave him, and ran off, runs off with Lorenzo the Christian. Um, and there's a, an interesting scene here. The cruelty of this betrayal on his daughter's part um, is, is so unfeeling that she takes the, the ring that um, the wife of Shylock, who's deceased, has given him and sells it to buy herself a monkey. And he says, I would not part with this ring for you know, thousands of monkeys, and how could my daughter do this? So things are going hard for him. Then in the middle of this court scene, Portia, um, the, the woman who uh, allowed Bassanio to marry her because he won, he picked the right casket, um, comes to court disguised as a lawyer. She and her, her uh, lady-in-waiting come disguised as a lawyer and his assistant, and she outwits Pi uh, Shylock. She says, first she says she tries to reason with him, and she has a famous speech here too. The quality of mercy is not strained, it droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesses him that gives and him that takes. And what she means by this is the, um, the legal right is yours to take the pound of flesh. But of course, you know, that's not going to be good for Antonio. So be reasonable be merciful, allow him his life, allow somebody else to pay the fine for him, and Shylock still refuses. Um, he doesn't uh, want to do this, he wants his pound of flesh, but now he loses because being a comedy, um, well, let me get to that in a minute, what happens is that um, Portia says, okay, you're entitled to your pound of flesh, but you're not entitled by this contract that you signed to one drop of blood. So if you shed a, blo a drop of blood, you, um, you have to be killed for it. If you kill Antonio in the process, you, you're killed for it. And on top of everything, um, even if you, at this point, even if you change your mind, um, you have insulted a Christian, and, and the penalty for threatening a Christian with killing him is death. So um, mercy you know, here is, is now out of the question. Um, and Shylock is on the you know, brink of disaster. But being a comedy, he doesn't die. However, he must convert, and Jessica and Lorenzo are going to inherit all his wealth and his house. He's allowed a small stipend for the rest of his life. He's allowed to do some business, and he doesn't have to starve. Um, but he's humiliated. And for him, there's a speech where basically he says, you know, what's the difference between death and giving up my my heritage. I, I'm, I have to convert and become a Christian. Um, and the play, though, um, kind of suggests that this is a good thing, that it's redeeming him by making him become a Christian. And certainly, the play implies very strongly, says it outright, in fact, that Jessica is upping herself by marrying a Christian. Okay, um, let me take a pause here from Shakespeare and move on to another play that was contemporaneous. It was written slightly before um, Shylock or, or uh, The Merchant of Venice was written uh, in 1594 by a man named Christopher Marlowe, a playwright as well. It's called The Jew of Malta. And like The Merchant of Venice, it's about a rich Jewish merchant. In this case, his name is Barabbas, whom the Maltese citizens, Malta is where he lives, um, he hates them because simply because uh, they all hate Jews. It's a very stupid plot. The Turks have demanded tribute or payments from the Maltese. The Maltese can't pay. So how do they get the money? They turn to the Jews and they say, we want half your wealth. Everything that the Jews have, half of it has to go to the state to pay the, the Turks. Um, all the Jews capitulate except Barabbas, who refuses to pay. Um, everybody else is afraid of the government, so they pay. 
Then the Maltese, in retaliation, take everything from Barabbas as a, as a punishment, his money, his house, and he, they then insult him as well. They say Jews have hateful lives and he's accursed in the, in the sight of heaven. Um, the play goes from there to worse. Uh, it becomes a free-for-all murder fest. Barabbas' daughter Abigail, who like, Sha like, like Shakespeare's Jessica in The Merchant, is also in love with a Christian whose name is Matthias. The Maltese governor's son, Ludovic, also loves her. These are two Christian men vying for one Jewish woman. Barabbas pits them against each other. Um, they kill each other. And he arranges to have the Turks kill the Maltese, and the Maltese kill the Turks. It becomes a bloodbath. Then he poisons um, a set of nuns living in a house, living in his house. Um, and one of them, accidentally, who's poisoned is his daughter, um, his daughter um, Abigail. And he had made her become a nun um, because he wanted her to assist him in this, you know, in this whole process. Then he forgot that she was there, so she dies. And betrayal follows betrayal. Finally, Barabbas slips up, and this not being a comedy, he's boiled alive at the end of the play. So this play is extremely cruel. Um, it makes The Merchant of Venice look almost like a comedy. Um, the British literary critic Brent Sterling said of this play, um, the, the English people find entertainment in Jew baiting. And that was the only point to the play, the, Mal the um, Jew of Malta. Um, with regard to Shakespeare's play, however, um, the scholar Stephen Greenblatt, a Blatt who wrote the book Will in the World, said that, um, explains it a little bit further. He says that the, the modest uh, concession that Shakespeare made to, um, to uh, Shylock as a human being is overshadowed by the fact that in England at that time, even though there were no Jews and had not been any Jews in the country since 1290, the very mention of a Jew evoked um, the image of the hook-nosed, greedy, gabardine-clothed, money-lending Jew. And this got a rise out of the audience. They thought this was funny. And Shakespeare, being a good businessman, he was, remember, not only a writer of plays, but an actor in plays, um, a director of plays, and he also owned parts of theaters like the Globe and others. Um, so he was a businessman. He was interested in making, um, making the play sell. And he knew that if he put a Shylock in there, um, people would respond to that. Jew baiting, once again. It was a big hysterical uh, thing to do to a play. It, it always evoked a laugh. Um, okay, so we have these two plays in uh, Shakespeare's time, and we have the precedent of, of Chaucer and his own anti-Semitism. <coughs> anti and um, it brings us to a question of why do we bother to read these plays as a modern Jewish audience if they're so hateful and um, they depict Jews in such an ugly way? And just about a year ago, uh, Rabbi Sachs, Lord Rabbi Sachs, the um, former chief rabbi, you all know who is, um, <laughs> Talk, gave a talk at Yeshiva University just about this time last year, and actually we all went, the whole senior class went last year um, to hear him, and he talked about uh, anti-Semitism in The Merchant of Venice. And the, the handout that I passed around were my notes on his lecture. He can also, by the way, be accessed by YouTube. You just plug in uh, Rabbi Sachs and Merchant of Venice, and you can get the whole lecture. It takes about 45 minutes. Um, and he had some answers to why we bothered to. First of all, he had some comments on Shakespeare and Merchant of Venice, and also some answers as to why we bothered to read him. Um, the first thing that he said was he made a distinction between Shakespeare and the play itself. He said that Shakespeare's play is certainly anti-Semitic, but Shakespeare himself was not so anti-Semitic. And he said if he had been anti-Semitic, he never could have really written the hath not a Jew eyes speech. And again, he too looks back at the, at the Jew of Malta for comparison. And he says that um, Shakespeare and not Marlowe um, made 
Shylock made his Jewish villain at least be a human. The, the half not a Jew I speech could only have been written by somebody who had a sensitivity to at least the fact that a Jew is also a human. Whereas Marlowe didn't see it that way. Um, his Jew, uh, Barabbas, gets what he deserves in that play. So that the play is strictly and completely anti-Semitic. But then Rabbi Sachs goes on to say, however, Shakespeare was not as broad-minded or, or as pro-Jew as, say, Rembrandt was at the same time painting in Holland. Uh, Rembrandt, many of his pictures have um, Jewish subjects and they're depicted with respect, even with love. They're seen as pillars of their community and he was known to have Jewish friends and so forth. So at the same time we have three examples. Um, on, the, on the good side is Rembrandt who gets along with Jews, likes them, respects them. On the very bad side is Christopher Marlowe and his like, hates Jews, you know, they, they're at the best they're a source of humor, at the worst they, sh they can be dispensed with. And then somewhere in the middle is Shakespeare who plays to the stereotype and who um, doesn't certainly come out in favor of Jews. The, the, the play says that, that Shylock got what he deserved and yet there is this, this scene in it where, where he says, hath not a Jew eyes, if you, if you prick us do we not bleed. Um, so he has this sensitivity to Jews, but you know, not, not as much as Rembrandt. Um, then he goes on to say that um, Shakespeare got what being a Jew is, he got it wrong. That he didn't understand that a few things about Jews. First of all, um, this never, this kind of situation never could have happened. No Jew understanding that um, Jews think that we're, um, we are created in the image of God and therefore, and the, the human body is sacrosanct. No Jew would ever engage in a contract that required maiming or disfiguring or in some way um, ruining the human body. So no Jew would have ever signed a contract in which he would uh, be awarded a pound of flesh if, he, if the contract you know, wasn't fulfilled. Um, on top of that, he says that uh, the concept that's held up in this play as being the, the justice in the play, Portia, Portia's speech on the quality of mercy is not strained, where she recommends to Shylock that he, yes, he's entitled to the legal benefits of his contract, but there's also a more human side, and it's mercy, and um, he should temper justice with mercy. Uh, Rabbi Sachs points out that that is not, as Shakespeare would have it, a Christian concept. That is a Jewish concept. That, and he points as one example of many. He says, just look at the Kol Nidre prayers. And that concept is very much embedded in, in those prayers and in other um, Jewish an analogs. And then he says, um, before he gets into the question of why we should read this stuff, um, he starts talking about the Jewish reaction to it. And he says that, he asked the question, how have we, as Jews, been able to overcome the stereotype to which Shakespeare succumbed? That we, uh, Shakespeare swallowed the stereotype, why don't we, why aren't we as a people more affected by it? And then he says that it's a miracle that in fact we never internalize that self-image. Instead, we define ourselves according to the belief that we are loved by God and therefore can remain impervious to assault. He points out that when Jews assimilate, they tend to begin to define themselves according to the, the Christian stereotypes and therefore they begin to abandon everything that makes us different and distinctive. He points out that this is what's tragic. Not only there in that situation do we lose our own support group, uh, when we shed our identity, but we are not accepted into their group either. And then when tyrants come to destroy Jews, they include assimilated Jews as well. And he repeated that the miracle is that we have not internalized the negative self-image, that although we have lived among Gentiles, we do not define ourselves in that way. He goes on to say that the merchant underlines the tension between Judaism and art. He asked what makes what art, when art 
makes a case for something repellent, how do we approach this? Do we watch Merchant, which exemplifies the myth of anti-Semitism? Do we play the music of the notoriously anti-Semitic Wagner or read the works of Heidegger, all of whom are anti-Semites? And he says that the answer is this. While Shakespeare couldn't overleap stereotypes, Jews can. Even in our own literature, we can overcome stereotypes. We have a humanitarianism, a humanitarianism that sees even our worst enemy as worthy of sympathy. We can sympathize with Esau. We understand that although Egyptians have historically become, been our enemies, it was Pharaoh's daughter who saved Moses. And while, te- while Merchant is technically a comedy, it's a dark comedy. Like most of Shakespeare's comedies, um, it's tinged with tragedy, just as most of his comedy, most of his tragedies have some comic relief as well. And he continued by pointing out that there is no Hebrew word for tragedy. Hebrew has instead adopted the Greek word um, for tragedy. Jews don't see the world as hopeless, and there can be no tragedy in a world that contains hope. Misfortune, yes. Hopelessness, no. Art as we see it, said Rabbi Sachs, and as Shakespeare partially saw it, though he could not fully overcome the stereotype, is lit by the quality of mercy. Jews see that art, as well as life, is built on on a morality comprising justice and love and hope. And so we continue to read Shakespeare, we continue to read Chaucer and Dickens and Hemingway and Philip Roth, And then once in a while we come across a writer such as the contemporary writer, uh, British novelist um, Kazuo Ishiguro, who has written, who wrote in 1988 a book called The Remains of the Day, um, which won a Man Booker Prize, a very distinguished literary prize, who's on our side. And we rejoice and we continue to hope. That's his message. And it's also, I think, the message of, of why we still teach this. Um, I think that when we teach books like The Merchant of Venice and we parse them and understand what was going on in the minds of the people who hate us, we're stronger for it. I think that we, um, we can combat stereotypes if we understand them, and like Rabbi Sachs, we can still have hope. Okay, um, I've done a lot of talking. Um, now let me open up to questions. <laughs> They'll be test on this tomorrow. <laughs> I took okay. notes, so it's fine. Okay, good. <laughs> Question. Uh, which was written first? Uh, Jew, of Malta. Jew of Malta. Jew of Malta. By, not by much. I, I think it's 1594 versus 1598. But it's in the air. They were contemporaries um, with a lot of other playwrights. And um, interestingly, the Jacobean plays, which happened after 1603, after Elizabeth died and James I becomes the king, became even more bloodthirsty. So the Jew of Malta was not even as bad as it gets after um, James came in because he was a very bloodthirsty and, and superstitious king. So if you look at Shakespeare, yeah. That you don't hold by the fact that Christopher Marlowe wrote some of Shakespeare. Oh, you know, that, okay. okay. There, there. Uh, the the playwrights during Shakespeare and Marlowe's time, including Kidd and a, you know a number of others, and there's a dozen that we still have, um, worked together on a lot of plays. A lot of them co-owned the theaters. They they intermingled. What we think of as the Merchant of Venice, we're pretty sure is really Shakespeare. Did he get a couple of ideas from Christopher Marlowe? I don't think he needed those ideas. I think they were in the wind. There was certainly anti-Semitism. Um, this, this plot to kill Elizabeth was very much a part of their life. They certainly knew that. Um, I don't think he needed Christopher Marlowe. Um, uh, you know, he probably knew of the Jew of Malta, but he didn't copy the Jew of Malta. His play is very different. And it's interesting that his main plot is one, his main plot is the Belmont plot, the, the, uh, the plot where um, Portia has her three caskets and is looking for a husband. That's such a stupid plot that nobody even, you know, when you think of The Merchant of Venice, you never think of that plot. You, you think of Shylock and what happened to him, because he's interesting. And um, it's also interesting that when people first read this play, they immediately assume that, um, that The Merchant of Venice is Shylock, but it isn't. Um, yes? Um, I'm not sure if you're 
at least in part, to portray him, um, takes over. That becomes what we think of. When, whenever I, and I think you know, most people, think of the Merchant of Venice, you don't immediately think of that wonderful scene where you know, the, the Bassanio is picking the right casket. It's, it's, it's dumb. It's, it's you know, not very interesting. It's kind of predictable. And it's uh, very um, saccharine. But the, what's interesting about this play is the interaction between the Christians and the Jews. Yes, Gabba. So just to fight for the notion that um, Shakespeare wasn't anti-Semitic, do you think that maybe he could have been influenced by xenophobic ideas because we see that when Portia is accepting all of these, all the royalty and the princes from other countries, she makes fun of the Prince of Aragon for being like arrogant and she makes fun of the Prince of Morocco for being dark skinned. Yes. She makes fun of, you know, Scottish people because, you know, in England at that time there was, you know, some kind of antagonism. But um, do you think maybe he could have been affected by xenophobic? Uh, absolutely, and we have proof of that in uh, in the character of um, Iago and um, Desdemona, and in um, Othello. Othello is also black, and you know he gets his too. Othello is a more <coughs> human character, though, far more human. Than, um, than Shylock. Uh, Othello is the victim in that play, but it certainly reflects the xenophobia of the time. And y yes, I think you're absolutely right. Um, and I think he struggled probably internally um, with the concept of you know, how could he take a human being and present him as not really human. So he does um, bend to that in The Merchant. Um, but at the same time, he's playing to the audience. He knows that they'll, they'll laugh if they see a Jew and if the Jew loses, that'll be great, um, and, they'll, and that'll sell tickets. And that's, you know, he's a businessman. So, yeah, but yes, I think you're absolutely right, yes. Also, like, I think he makes, Shakespeare makes, like, a contrast between Shylock and everyone else in the way that, like, it's, there's a lot of bonds, and Shylock is the only one who actually keeps his bond, and nobody else does. Yes. So, like, in that way, he's kind of illustrating that he's the most like loyal and like the mo like he sticks to his guns the most out of anyone in the play. So like even though the peop like the characters might be exhibiting this like these anti-Semitic tendencies, like I think Shakespeare like overall. Um, yes, I think, and you're right about the bonds, and that's a symbol in many plays. For example, in King Lear, <coughs> um, the whole play hinges. It's a terrible, terrible tragedy, and I don't recommend that you know you go out and read it for fun because it's I I can't even read that anymore. I've read it so many times and it breaks my heart. But Central to that play is the bond um, between father and daughter, father and child. And um, one of the daughters of King Lear, who is banished in the play, um, when he asks his daughters, do you love me, everybody lies and says, yeah, more than the world. And Cordelia, the good daughter, says to him, I love you according to my bond, no more, no less. So the concept of the bond for Shakespeare is very, very important. In this um, case, it's, it's a, a legal document, and um, even Portia says to, to Shylock, you have every right to have what's in that bond. So the, the concept of a bond for Shakespeare is very important. Um, but then, you know, she says, yeah, but there's no blood in that bond, and therefore it falls apart. Mm -hmm. But yes, I think you're absolutely right. Sheva. Do you think that maybe, um, like, the um, Jew of Malta and those type of stories, the characters, he wasn't actually like that anti-Semitic. He just like the more dramatic you make a character, the better the story is. So maybe he was just doing it because at that time, like anti-Semitism was like the trend kind of. So by him making the story very anti-Semitic, like it attracts more readers and people enjoy it more. Like yeah. I'm sure he was like he believed in anti-Semitism kind of, but like he might not have been as bad as he portrays his characters in the book. You know what I mean? It's possible. It's certainly, what, what's disturbing about that book is 
Um, and, and also the Shylock part of Shakespeare's play is the, the fact that um, the people have this stereotype, even though there's no Jews in the country and right. hadn't been for 300 years, like they still, belief. it's a common belief. It was like what happened in Russia when the communists took over, they, they banned religion. For 70 some odd years, whatever it was, when the wall came down, the first thing that came back was anti-Semitism. You know, nobody was a Jew then, legally. Um, but they, that didn't die, and it doesn't die here. In the whole time that the Jews are out of England, all those hundreds of years, um, they were, were not liked when they were there, they were not liked when they came back, and in the mi middle there, when they weren't even there, um, the stereotype persisted. You know, where does this come from? Yes. <coughs> you know, Mr. Sachs is right when he says that we as a people, we don't uh, like to stereotype other people, but there is one, one group that we do stereotype, and I'll say it's Amalek because we have good and we have evil, and we try to find the people that will somehow fit into the evil uh, category. Um, and the reason we as a people can feel that way, is, I think, is because we know we'll never actually see an Amalekite. We won't uh, find a sympathetic one, one that we actually like, so therefore we can uh, say that if he's evil. Maybe Marlowe was looking for personification of evil, so he picked the people that he'll, he knows they'll never see. That that could be, and uh, you know, I, I I would still say he too was a businessman, and he they all knew that if they had a Jew in the play, people would pay to come see him suffer. Mm -hmm. So you know, mm -hmm. but I think I think your point is well taken. Any other comments or questions? Yes. A, a reference to uh, your statement: Why do we read his works? I mean, would we really, if we didn't have to take regents and if we didn't have yes, to do I, I believe for <laughs> college, I mean. I had to do this when I was a young woman. Yeah. Now that I'm smarter, I would not go to see a Shakespeare play. Uh, why would I give money for this? Why would I give money to anything that's leftist, that's against my principles? Yeah. Um, personally, while I can see your point of view, I, I completely disagree with it. You know, I, I was born with a book in my mouth. And um, there are other books. I, I feel that Shakespeare of all the books I have ever written, Shakespeare is not in a league by himself. The um, understanding um, of, of human nature, in, including the um, uh, tension between Christian and Jew, is unsurpassed in Shakespeare. When he talks about um, King Lear and his problems with his daughters, when he talks about Hamlet and his problems with the fact that his father is dead and his mother is remarried, his father's brother murderer. Um, the, these are gut-wrenching, and I think that the insights that he has make it worth reading, even though we don't agree with everything he says, and, we, and, and it hurts. It really hurts. When I first picked up that book that I referred to, The Sun Also Rises, I was crushed. I was a, you know, a freshman in college, and I was going to take this wonderful course, and I read some Hemingway, and I read some Faulkner, and I read some Fitzgerald, and here it is, the first page. I'm nothing, you know, and, and that hurts. But I think that we have to be stronger we over and over. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um. I think just in reference to that point, and also to reference what Gaba just said about there being xenophobia in the air. I think that in a lot of Shakespeare's plays, the characters aren't only anti-Semitic. But they're anti everyone else. Yes, that's true. Like, and that's like what God in, saying too. Yeah, but that. but in everything, mm -hmm. like in Hamlet, when those witches are using the liver of a blaspheming Jew, they're also using Macbeth. like oh oh sorry sorry in Macbeth. I was gonna also reference yeah. Hamlet. Yes. So in Macbeth, when they're they're also using like like eyes from like this woman who is Christian, but like eating a lot, and they're just jealous of her food or something. Like they're using and like lizards. They're they're just equating everyone. Yeah. With, with everyone else and saying that everyone is just bad. Yeah. And in Hamlet... Everyone with, who isn't them. Right. The other. And in Hamlet, with, with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, I don't, I don't think that they're necessarily like the bad, corrupt characters in that play because everyone is bad and corrupt. <laughs> right. And the whole point of that play is that Hamlet has to fix the corruption of the state. Yes, that's, that's so, true. But what they are is they are still other. And they're right, a laughing they're stock. Um, they're the common belief in that play. And you know, um, you're right about they're not the evil, they're not Shylock, they're not, they're certainly not um, uh, Barabbas, they're, uh, they're the laughing stock. And um, the blaspheming Jew, the liver of the blaspheming Jew is just, I think it's a throwaway line, I think you're right, and there's other disgusting things in there, but you don't see the liver of a lying Christian. Right. Um, they make a distinction between themselves and the other.
Right, but I think just the point is that it's almost like social commentary mm -hmm. in that everyone hates everybody else. And yes. Like, like, I don't think it's just specifically aimed towards Jews. I think it's aimed towards everybody. I, I think you can make a case for that, and, you, and God is on the same page there. And, I, you know, yes, I agree with you. I think you're, there certainly is something to be said for that. Amanda, did you ever hear about that? Um, yeah, just to comment earlier on that point. Um, I don't know, just to go further, like, I, I just think that if you're reading a novel, yeah, there can be terrible things in it, but, like, we read other things. For example, all the novels that um, we're reading this year have to do with, you know, discrimination against women. Yeah. And do I feel that that's wrong? Yes, but we're still learning about it, and the more that you learn about the things that are against you, the more you can argue against them and have yes. a point to defend yourself. I think you're right.